just begin by saying again uh, that this is Pentecostal Sunday. I'll be making some reference to it in just a moment. But I want to go back for just a moment or two and mention uh, years ago how Pentecost was not really that popular. Uh, there was a stigma there in Pentecostalism, as we called it. But those days have changed. Uh, Today, one of the most rapid-growing churches in the world are Pentecostal churches. That's not making a boast here today because this is a Pentecostal church because I thank God that I know the Pentecostal churches are not the only churches. Uh, we have people all over this world that do not call themselves Pentecost, but they have been born again of the Spirit of God. They have their names written in heaven, how many knows that the Church of God, the Baptist, the Methodist, Presbyterian, just keep naming them. That's a name that we have. But really, the church is an organism. It's for born-again believers. And every one of you that are here today that have been born again, you're joint heirs with Christ. Your inheritance is right along with Him. Hard to get a hold of, hard to comprehend. But we're in the same family, no matter what denomination you belong to. If you're born again, we are in the same family. Now, I want you, if you would, to turn with me, uh, Acts 2, just reading verse 1 to begin with. Acts 2, verse 1. And I'm going to uh, speak this morning on uh, Pentecost, and because... Uh, this is Pentecostal Sunday, and in my ministry, I don't always preach a message uh, concerning a special day, but God did move on me to preach concerning Pentecost today, and I absolutely look forward to ministering this subject, and I pray that God would help me to have clarity and that I am able to explain myself according to the Scriptures. So if you would... While you're turning there, I hope you're already there. Whisper a prayer and ask God to help me today, and I appreciate that. I know we've already prayed, but pray for me. Acts 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the day of Pentecost was a Jewish feast held 50 days after Passover, it was a time to celebrate the first fruits of the harvest. At Passover, the first sheaves reaped from the barley harvest was presented to God, but at Pentecost, the first fruits of the whole of the wheat harvest were given to God. Therefore, Pentecost is called the day of first fruits. Also, in Jew Jewish traditions, taught that Pentecostal uh, Pentecost com commemorated the day when the law was given to Israel. The Jews sometimes called Pentecost joy of the law. So on the Old Testament day of Pentecost, Israel received the law, and on the new day of Pentecost, the church received the spirit of grace in its fullness. Now, I want to stop here and comment, make a personal comment, I'm glad that I'm not living under the law. I'm glad that I'm living in the day of grace, aren't you? And the grace of God, you've heard it over and over, and I'm going to tell you again, is nothing more, nothing less than God's merciful understanding of us and his kindness and his forgiveness and, and compassion. And I know that many of us that are here today, if we were Jewish, and we had to live the life that we've lived prior to being saved, uh, we would be in trouble. Because I want to establish this, which is common knowledge. We hear it, but we need to be reminded of it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we do believe that God will forgive us of sin, uh, cast those sins as far as the east is to the west never to remember it ever against us again. But uh, in this tr tradition uh, of Pentecost, uh, I, I want to say uh, 
that you do not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost when you get saved. That's why I ask you to pray for me and ask God to help me to give clarity in what I'm going to preach here today. You see, you cannot come to God except the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, draws you. There's just no way you can come to Him. And we call that conviction. He convicts us. He don't condemn us, but he convicts us, and he draws us to himself. And I don't care what kind of church you attend. I don't care what kind of tremendous services they have. You can't get saved just any time you get ready. You absolutely cannot. God has to call you, but the grace of God that brings us salvation has appeared unto all men. In other words, sometime in your life, God's going to give you a door to walk through, and it's called a door of faith. You walk by faith. And you're saved by grace through faith. As I've already quoted this morning, it's not of yourself. You've got nothing to boast about. It's strictly a gift that God gives you from heaven. So if you're sitting here today under the sound of my voice, and you know that you have been born again, and you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you have every reason to be thankful today that God has blessed you in that way. You see, to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, as I studied and I prepared, I thought how necessary it is for us to believe the written Word of God. Holy men of old were moved upon by the Holy Ghost as they penned the 66th book of the Bible. The Holy Ghost was instrumental in using men to write those 66 letters. And when people pick up the Bible and they never get excited, they never get involved, I want to tell you, you haven't approached the Word of God right. The Word of God is alive, and the Lord wants us worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And before you read, and I haven't always done this, and I don't do it today. I don't go every time into prayer before I read, but a big part of the time I'll pray and ask God, Lord, let my ears be open that I can hear what the Scriptures are saying. And when you enter into it with a spiritual mind, and the Word of God is illuminated, it illuminates your mind. It clears your mind. And before you know it, you understand and you know that you're reading a living word. And you can get all excited about it when you're in the Spirit and the people around you, if you try to share it with them, and they're not in the Spirit, you can get as excited as you want to and they're still dry as a Texas wind. Because you have to receive this in the Spirit. To get excited, you've got to get in the Spirit. Now, I know the just shall live by faith. I know this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I understand all of that. I can't live by my feeling, but thank God the Word of God is alive. And even though I don't walk by my feelings, I thank God when feeling comes. <laughs> I thank the Lord when I'm allowed and you're allowed to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know it's all right to get excited, especially in a Pentecostal church. They expect us to get excited. They've already heard that we get excited, and then sometimes they come into our service and say, they're no different than we are. You hear what I'm trying to share with you? God is real. His word is real. We're a Pentecostal church, and we know that Pentecost is not a denomination. It's a Jewish festival. We had just read about that, but yet we need to validate everything we believe with the Word of God. Don't validate it with just a preacher, your pastor, or an evangelist, or your special preacher. Search the Word of God yourself. Be like the Bereans were when Paul preached. They went back and studied to make sure that he was in the Old Testament Scripture because at that time they didn't have the New Testament. 
but they searched diligently to make sure who they were listening to was coming out of the book. And when you begin to do that, you prove all things. You hold fast to that which is good, and anything you don't understand, don't latch on to it, just let it pass you up. It don't mean there's not truth there. You're just not ready to receive that truth. You can only work in the realm of faith that God puts you in. Don't try to be like somebody else. Just be yourself. How many believe God just wants us to be ourselves? Don't claim faith you don't have. Don't try to be spiritual when you're not spiritual. Be real. People are looking for real people. And I want to tell you, when they come in contact with God, I said it, and you've heard me testify to this over and over. When the Lord saved me, and I got up that night in that tent, and I got to hold of that mic. I didn't have a clue what I was going to say, but I'm still saying it. I'm going to say it again here today. This is real. This is real. That's what I said, Brother JT, when I got a hold of the mic. I didn't have anything to say. I just was bursting on the inside. I just received Christ. I felt like I had to say something, and I was like a broke record. I remember it like it was yesterday. When God puts me in the spirit, I remember it. It comes back to me. I remember having to hold that mic. I just started saying, this is real, this is real. And that's where I hung up and I handed it back to him. That's all I had to say. I'm standing here in front of you today. This is still real. This is still real. In fact, it's getting realer all the time. Amen. You see, the Lord gave me a measure of faith. Everybody here has a measure of faith. But you exercise that faith and it will increase. And then there's a gift of faith. And we go from faith to faith to glory to glory, amen. There's no stopping place. There's never a place that we stop. We just keep feasting on the Word of God. Isn't it wonderful to be able to feast on the Word of God? So I want to make a reference now to what I just read. You do not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost when you get saved. Now I have scripture to back this up in Luke, the 10th chapter, verse 19 through 20. And if I need to pause here. If you need these scriptures later, that might be the best way to do it. I'm open to you. I'll let you get these scriptures. But uh, the disciples, before they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, it is without a doubt they were saved. They were saved. They were on their way to heaven. And the scripture that I'm fixing to read backs it up. God had sent 70 of them out to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to cast out devils. And when their mission trip was over and they came back, uh, they began to rejoice. And they were being thankful for what God had done. And they said, Behold, uh, Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you now notice this they were rejoicing they were happy that the devils were subject to them they were happy that they were able to preach the gospel they were happy that the sick was healed but jesus said notwithstanding in this rejoice not don't rejoice because god gave you good sermons don't rejoice because you were able to cast demons out of people don't rejoice so much that people were healed, uh, but rejoice rather, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, does that tell you what it tells me? They were Christian. Do I have to get 20 other scriptures to back that up, or is that sufficient? Jesus said it. If Jesus said it, I don't need another scripture to back that up. Now, if you're forming a doctrine, you have to compare scripture with scripture. But when you're hearing from the man that, 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 that saved you, when you're hearing from the deity that changed you when, you, when you hear the word of God and he said, when you get saved, I'm going to make you a new creation. Well, when you hear him say, these people's name was written in heaven, the Bible said that that, let you know that when that day comes, they're ready right now, even if they don't receive the Holy Ghost. Receiving the power of the Holy Ghost does not confirm your salvation. 
Your salvation is being born again of the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is to empower you to be able to do what you do through the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's what's missing. I'll be honest with you. That's the ingredient that we need here more of. Amen. And all over this world, we need to go back to our personal Bible study and quit taking word of me and I know we have the fivefold ministry I know we have apostles we have prophets we have evangelists we have pastors we have teachers and they're given to us to stabilize stabilize us and, and to make us to where we won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and it wants to get us to a place of perfection now that word perfection when you study that it's not talking about being perfected the way we understand it It's talking about to grow up, to be mature, to know what you believe in. If you really know what you believe in, you won't get in an argument with somebody trying to prove what you believe in. You're comfortable with what you believe in. And when you're talking to somebody that you're 100% convinced it's the Word of God, you don't have to win the argument. You don't win the argument. You already are the winner if God's Word is backing you up. Uh, You know and I know that you have to be sure of what you believe in in this last day. It's true with every other age, but we're living in a day and time that the first thing, and I mentioned this in a message I recently preached, when they were on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to Jesus and said, what's the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? The first thing that he said to those people, let no man deceive you. You look around, you see people being deceived on every hand. I could get into some areas that people have let down the standards. They've gone totally contrary to the Word of God. They're allowing things to happen in fundamental church. used to be fundamental churches. When they allow certain things to happen, they're no longer a fundamental church. They have been moved from the sound doctrine that God gave to us. So when you get to the place that you begin to see people stamping their approval on things that God calls an abomination, that's time to open your eyes and say, hey, we're living in the last day. We're living just before the coming of the Son of Man. Church, we're right on the brink of the Lord coming back. We need power in this last day. And it will not come without dedication. Brother Willer teaching this morning on Pentecost very understandable on some of the things that came to my mind while he was teaching. I thought, in this busy world we're living in today, Daniel said, in the last days, knowledge would be increased. People would be going to and fro. We got people today, you, you, now I'm, I'm going to get a little humorous here, and, and I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. How many has ever looked into your family tree? Well, Bradford County, all we have here is a telephone pole. We don't have branches. We're inbred. We're all kin. If you don't believe it, talk to Steve Wynn. He's kin to every person in this county. He'll figure it out. He'll weave. He'll get. Yeah, we're kin. But the truth of it is, if you weave through it, we are all kin. We all came from Adam and Eve. And then, of course, we came from the three sons of Noah and their wives. So we're all related, whether you like it or not. And I know we got Crawfords and we got Griffiths here in this church. Somebody said, Gene, you're taking a chance. No, I'm not. You know what I'm fixing to say is the truth. You got some Griffiths that say, we're not of that group. You got Crawfords. No, we, we're not really kin. Well, yes, you are. I got to get away from there. Man, I can feel myself bogging down right there. But here, let's go back now. We've established the fact, and I want to just mention in Acts, the first chapter, it gives a list, not of all of them, but there was 120 that went back to Jerusalem when the Lord had told them to go back. They went back with great joy, praise that and magnifying the name of the Lord. It mentioned the Lord's brothers. Didn't he mention whether his sisters were there or not? Don't mean they wasn't there, 
But it don't even, the, the Jesus' sisters never were named in the Bible, never give their name. And you think you feel neglected. Being a sister, half-sister to the Son of God, and they didn't even put your name down. Boy, we'd have trouble in this prideful society we live in. As I don't want nothing to do with that Bible, they didn't even put my name in it. Huh? Think about these kind of things. It kind of gives a little humor there. But here's the thing. Here's what stands out to me. I think Mary, the mother of Jesus, was one of the most precious women that ever lived. I know there's a religion got it a little distorted. I understand they think they can appeal to her and she can pass the word on to her son. But there's only one mediator between God and man. And that's Christ Jesus. There's no purgatories. There's no in-between. When an axe is laid to the trunk of the tree, the way that tree falls, that's the way it's going to be. I don't care how many candles you light. I don't care how many rosary. I don't care what you do. The Word of God does not confirm that. Somebody said, Gene, that kind of preaching offends people. It shouldn't offend you. What I'm telling you is the truth. There's only one way to heaven. That is through Jesus Christ. There is no in-between. There is no in-between. There's not a lot of different ways into heaven. There's only one way, and that is through Christ Jesus. Oh, I feel this as I preach it, church. Somebody said, Gene, what are you talking about? You feel it. Just what I said, I feel it. You mean that's your emotion? I feel God. Somebody said, Gene, you mean you're standing there behind that pulpit, and you expect me that you're standing there, and I see you kind of acting funny. Yes, that's God. And I, I, I remember, Brother Willard, I can always reflect. Where'd Willard go? I wish he was here. I want him to hear this. I didn't even know I was going to say it. It's not in my notes. It wasn't in my mind. But when we were working across the road over there, I always heard that, be careful, 220 will kill you, but if you get a hold of 110, it won't turn you loose. I'd heard that all my life. We were over there working, had an old skill saw. Should have thrown it away. It had a short in it. And it was in the morning time. My feet were wet. The grass needed mowing, to be honest with you. And I done got my feet wet, and I was standing in the bathroom in the back of the church there, and Willard needed the saw. He was cutting something, and I, I, it was already plugged in. I just picked it up and kind of done like that. It lit me up. I couldn't get rid of it. I thought, this is the truth. You can't turn it loose. And Willard smartened up. We are from Bradford County, so give us credit. It took us a moment or two to unplug that thing. Ask me if I felt that. Well, I'm telling you, I feel this. I feel this. Sometimes it gets stronger. Sometimes I preach, I don't feel it. I don't like to preach when that happens. But God said, Gene, keep on preaching. You got to be instant in season. You got to be instant out of season. You've got to continue to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. For the time is going to come that men will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to accept the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Let's go now to Luke, the 24th chapter, reading verses 45 through 53, and I'll just go ahead and again, I'll give you these scriptures if you're interested in them after the service. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooves Christ to suffer and to rise, raise from the dead the third day, rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and, and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, here it is. I said the promise of my Father upon you, but tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continuously in the temple praising and magnifying or blessing God. Now, 
they were in the temple as well as in the upper room. And they were continuously praising and magnifying the name of the Lord. Now, one of the things where people get bound down seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they've heard so many different stories about the baptism. Some of them scriptural, some of them are not. And that's why I always encourage you, do your own Bible study. Study for yourself. Let God touch you. Once you get convinced, then God will convince you. But you've got to be willing to spend some time there. You know, we're an instant type of society. They want everything right now. But we need to slow down and realize we need time of meditation. We need time to not just scan over the Word of God as well as read it. We need to study it. A big difference in the two methods. There's one thing about reading it. There's another thing going back and studying it. And I'm just going to do something right now, being repetitious. Now, I've already went over the fact that these people were born again. They were, their names were written in heaven. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, I didn't complete my thought earlier, and I want to go back to that. That is a blessed, blessed scripture when the Lord let us know through recording under the power of the Holy Ghost which, which is always the way that was when the Word of God was written. It was always by the power of the Holy Ghost. It named Mary the mother of Jesus. Now, this is what really, really uh, gets me, and, and I, I do this every time I get in this area. My wife, uh, we had three children, Benji, Shane, and Regina. And, and the mothers of these children, your wife, there's something about these lady folks that when that baby gets big enough that that baby starts moving around and an elbow goes across mom's stomach, feel right here. I wanted no part of that. That was always boogery to me. I thought, I don't want to feel another human being's body inside of somebody else's body. But I did it a time or two. And it was just as boogery when I took my hand away. I thought, I don't like this. I don't like, wait till he comes out or she comes out. Used to, we didn't know. And, and let them come out and I'll hold them and, and, and all. But I don't want any part of that. But then when you allow your mind to get intrigued and, and you want to look deeper into the deity and, and you want to understand how human that Jesus was, he was born just like you were. It's just that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father, that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Born of the Virgin Mary. And he was crucified, buried, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven. And this very moment at the right side of the Father, making intercession for us. But here, Mary, birth. Emmanuel into this world, God being with us. But she needed to go back to the upper room to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I'm not going to go through all the scriptures I have here. I have enough of it memorized. I'm just going to speak to you just out of my heart. You see, on the day of Pentecost, they had gathered there in one place, one accord. And, and the Bible said in the second chapter that 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 the Holy Ghost uh, began to come in to that upper room. When Hale and I were privileged to go to Israel, and I've shared this with you before, but I want to inject it again in this message this morning. Uh, when we went to this site, the upper room, they pretty well got this pinned down. They think this actually is a place. Some of those places are in question, but they actually think this is the upper room. And we went there on a day. I don't know why they didn't have it shut down. They were doing construction on the upper room. I expected to go into a sacred, powerful presence of God. I went into a construction site. Didn't feel a thing. Wasn't even excited. I thought, this is not a good day to come in to the upper room. But I want to explain something. I know that's still a special place. I don't take that away at all from my mind. You know what made it special that day? That was their day. That was the day of Pentecost. 
about 120. I don't know why I don't get an accurate number there. It says about 120 were there, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. That's what made it special. If I'd have been there when that happened, it wouldn't have been like the day Hazel and I were there. If I'd have been there when that rushing mighty wind come into that place, when the cloven tongues began to fork out and rest upon their head, don't you know, don't you know that had to have been an experience, a phenomenon that never has occurred. And I've seen things where people say the cloven tongues, but I'm just giving you gene bass now what I believe. I don't think those things have really ever reoccurred. And I could be wrong. I, I could be wrong there. But I tell you, the speaking in tongues has reoccurred. But the cloven tongues, like as a fire, the rushing mighty wind, Listen, I've said in services here in this church, I didn't hear a wind, but I have been on this platform when the church, the Spirit of God began to move. I can't see it because Nicodemus, you know, when he came to Jesus by night, and Jesus said, uh, you know, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Nicodemus had already told him, we know your teacher comes from God, for no man can do these miracles that you're doing except God be with him. He said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus didn't understand. He said, you mean i got to enter a second time into my mother's womb? He said, no, Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, a man must be born again. Then here it comes. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeneth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Amen. Now going back, I, I feel God this morning. I feel him as I'm preaching to you right now. Somebody said, I don't feel a thing. I didn't say you did. I said, I did. Did you hear me? It's my experience. And if it's real, everybody here could say, Gene, I don't believe a word you're saying. I said, keep on believing it, but that feeling's still here. You see, today is the day of my salvation. Today is the day of your salvation. I'm not to judge you of what level you're on with Christ. I just know where I'm at with Christ. And I believe every one of us, if we're truthful and we think about this day of Pentecost, we think about the power that we need to witness, we've got to get excited. But you cannot have zeal without knowledge. The zeal without knowledge will run into fanaticism. It's good to have good music. It's good to be under anointed music. But you need an anchor of the soul. You need to hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against the Lord. You can come into a Pentecostal church where they've emphasized singing and praise and worship. I'm not saying all of that is out of order, but I want to tell you I come into the Pentecostal church we didn't need a team up here directing people how to worship. People came in and spontaneously because God moved up on them. They began to worship. I want to tell you, it don't matter how loud you holler. I'm kind of a loud person, but you don't have to be loud to be Pentecost. You don't have to be an emotional person to become Pentecost. But I want to tell you what you do have to be. If you're sitting in the ball field and the Gators are playing and your team is the Gators, you're emotional. You may be the most reserved person. You may be a little timid, but especially if your son's a quarterback. <laughs> I want to magnify what I'm trying to say. And that quarterback throws a ball and, and the tight end, he receives a ball. Well, that tight end, grandma's up there and that's her child. You try to get them to be unemotional. That's my grandson out there. I want to tell you, it's time and high time. We get excited about the word of God. It's time and high time that we're not ashamed of the manifestation of the working of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, yes, I know, and I've shared this with you when we were across the road over there. Man, I tell you, we have some services we, we don't have here now because we got infiltrated with Baptists. You've been here long enough, I can play with you now. I can play with you now. See, I've had to maneuver around as a Pentecost preacher for many, many years. And I know how you felt. I felt the same way. See, I got saved in a Pentecost. I come into this. I come into it. Oh, I won't even get back into that. 
I've had to sit and preach, and you sit there like a knot on the log, and I think they just knew how to praise God. We could have church. Are you here? I'll tell you something. The best Pentecostals you can have is Baptist culture. And you know where I got this information from? See, I've been dominated with Church of God all my Christian life, but I've had a lot of Baptist friends, and believe it or not, I think they're saved. You heard Frank. I think they are. Having fun. But my kids, some of their friends would come over there, just got this old block building with a tin roof. My stepdad loved that place. In fact, when we moved from that side of the road over here and moved over there, he quit coming for a while. He told my mother, he said, I like that old tin top building they were in over there. He didn't know anything about Pentecost. He told my mother, now I want you to listen. I want you to listen to this. If you knew him, you would appreciate what I'm saying. He was as straightforward and as real as they come. He was a real man. He was a real man. He said, Edna, I got it figured out about them people out there. He said, have you ever noticed how they clap? He said, you know if they turn their hands like that, it'd make them so sore. Think about it. He's looking at the physical demonstration. Got him to camp meeting. Preacher, I remember the subject. A breath of fresh air. We were sitting about two seats back. Normally, I don't, anybody that goes to camp meeting with me knows I sit kind of back. I don't like up front. It gets too loud. I, I don't like music. Sometimes we get it too loud here, too. I just tell you the truth. I want to just truth up on it, amen. I want to hear the singing. I, 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 want, to, I want the music to, to accompany the singers. I don't want to sit here trying to hear what that singer's having to say. I want it all to blend in. But we were up about three seats back. You're talking about a preacher preaching. I know he didn't preach that sermon just for my stepdad. I know he didn't. But he did in a way. You'd have to know this man to appreciate what I'm saying. God broke his heart. He cried like a baby. He said, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't believe it myself. He was sitting over about having convulsion, crying. I thought, my goodness. And when it was over, they dismissed. And people were coming by. He didn't reach out and grab you and hug your neck. He wasn't that kind of a man. He was grabbing people. He was crying. He was holding on to people. You know what happened to him? He got a touch from glory. You know what we need to happen to what I call rank centered? I love rank centered. You know, they're lost. Got a lot of religious people. When you get through talking, you don't know if they're saved, lost, up, or down. They're living like the devil and claiming Christianity. I got to be careful here. I'll get out of order. I like it when I look at a man. He knows he's lost. Amen. You see, you can't get saved till you know you're lost. Can't get saved till you know you're lost. And and Lewis and I, I'm, I'm gonna cut off of him. I love that man. He wasn't my real dad, but he was my stepdad, and I learned more from him in a, in a realistic way. He didn't play games with you. And I preached Miss Dyke's funeral, Marlene's funeral, uh, mom mom's funeral, or dad, I believe it was. Lewis wasn't one to come, compliment you, nothing like that. No, that wasn't in him. That wasn't his nature. And I got through with that service that day, and I saw him coming across the parking lot. And I'm not boohooing now. I'm not sad. I'm happy. I'm telling you, I'm happy. He come walking across. He was crying. He coming to me. All he said, said, Gene, that was really good. And when he turned around and walked off, I'm telling you, my soul burst. Listen. We got good sinners. You know, everybody's got good in them. Your worst enemy's got good in them. And God loves them just as much as he loves you. God has no respect to a person. I don't care how low you are. I don't care how deep in sin you go. God will reach down and pick you up. He'll pick you up. He'll save you. You'll be going in one direction. And when Pentecost gets through with you, you'll be headed in another direction. I want to encourage every one of you. I want to encourage you. 
we're in the last days. I want to go over, I was going to use other scriptures, but I just feel, well, the Lord just go to the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. Paul, Paul is going through the upper coast, went through Ephesus, and he found 12 believers there. And he asked them the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said, well, what were you baptized unto? They said, John's baptism. He said, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance. You should believe on him. That would come after him. I want to tell you something. The Holy Ghost fell on those men. They prayed for them. The Holy Ghost fell on them. And, and, and they were believers. You don't receive the power of the baptism when you get saved. But you do receive the Holy Ghost because you can't even call Jesus Lord without the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So you have him residing in you. But there's a gift. And Jesus said in the book of John, it's expedient for you. It's necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, I'll send you another comforter, even the Spirit of truth. He's with you now. He shall be in you. And, and Peter, as it was brought out in the adult Sunday school class, Brother Rick stood up and read the scriptures on the day of Pentecost. When those people saw what was going on at Pentecost, there were people there on that festivity day from all over the world. God orchestrated it to be that way. He wanted this to spread all over the world. So this feast was necessary to spread the gospel. But when they came in, some were amazed, some were in doubt, some were mocking. Some were saying, these men are drunk on new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, Men and brethren, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these men are not drunken as you suppose, seeing this is but the third hour of the day. But this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last day, saith God, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your young men are going to see visions. Your old men are going to dream dreams. And upon my servants and my handmaids, I'm going to pour out of my spirit. And then when this sermon was over, it was a lot longer than I'm given. But at the end of it, the Bible said they came to him convicted. Their hearts had been touched. And they said, men and brother, what must we do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll baptize you and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For he is for you, for your children, to all that are afar off, even, that's you, all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I'm telling you here today, if you're born again, you're a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I don't care what you've heard. Let me tell you this. I'm just going to get out and talk to you. When I got saved, I wasn't a person that used filthy, filthy language all the time. But just like many of you here, my vocabulary was far from being cleaned up. I didn't have a clean vocabulary. I've heard people say that some people's convinced that this baptism of the Holy Ghost is nothing but the devil. I want to tell you something. I had a language, an unknown tongue. It's known in hell. Vocabulary. Think about the word sinner people use. And yet they'll look around and say, I don't know about that doctrinal thing they got there. Well, I'm getting it out of the Bible. Where are you getting that filthy language from? You got a language there that's of the devil because when the Lord comes into your heart and your life, he'll sanctify your tongue. You'll quit using those foul words. God will change you. He'll take you to different places. You'll look different. You'll act different. And you don't have things in common with the old friends you used to have. I had close friends and sin. Had guys to stick with you, go with you all the way. When you get saved, that was one of the hard things for me. It was hard for me. I come back from Alabama. I thought I was ready for. I was ready for it. I, I was ready, but I still had some things that I had to face. I didn't know I'd have to face. But I reached my old buddies and I'd witness to them. I'd expect with a change that taken place in my life, I thought they'd just get saved. It don't work that way. I didn't know it. I was young in the Lord. I've already preached what works. The Holy Ghost has to call you. The Holy Ghost has to convict you. I don't care what kind of life change you see in somebody. 
There's only certain times you can be saved. You need to pay, if you don't pay any attention to anything I've said here today, you need to take this home with you. If you're sitting here and you know you're not saved and God's dealing with you, don't you take that for granted. That won't stay on you. And when that leaves you, you don't have the opportunity you have now. You can sit under all the good preaching. You can sit under all the good singing. You can go to revival after revival. But the word of God is true. Let every man be a liar, but let God be the truth. You cannot come to the Father except the Spirit of God draws you. And if you're listening to me now and you're not saying, God's opened up your ears to hear this. Not for the baptism if you're lost. Forget about the baptism. He's opened your ears to get saved. And if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you'll believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. Not maybe or I think so. You shall be saved. I bring this message to a close. There's people all over this church when God's got a hold of you, he changed you completely. I could pick people out. I wouldn't do that today. I won't promise you next Sunday whether I will or not. You know I don't do that. Unless God moves on me, I don't do that. But I, I know I could, there's people all over here. He brought you out of deep mire clay. You had no hope when you come to the Lord. And I know, and I've preached this, and I don't have time to get involved in it, but there's three kind of people. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? See, when you come out of a life where you drank and you partied, and that's, that was my lifestyle before I got saved, you've got to remember once you get leveled out, everybody didn't come from the same background you came from. They are good sinners in this world, and some of them actually live better than some people that are in church claiming to be Christian. They're good people, but they're just as lost as a person that's so deep in sin. You see, it's not how many sins you commit that's taking you to hell. It's the fact that you reject the plan of salvation. When Jesus is presented to you by the Father and by the Holy Ghost, he is your mediator. You need to take advantage of that. And I'll guarantee this. I'm not an insurance salesman. I've got a 100% policy here. If you are regretful of what your life has been, if you're really sorry on the inside, I'll guarantee this policy. If you'll come to the Lord and simply acknowledge that you're lost, that you need help, he'll save you. You've heard me. I've got to bring my brother into this. I've got to. Coming from church, I went to bed. My brother was staying with us. Boy, Hazel and I got married. Hadn't been saved that long. I still kind of connected to a lot of my buddies and not connected in the wrong way. They just hadn't found out, and I hadn't found out we had nothing in common anymore. And I had a friend, and my brother was living with me, and I was laying in the bed about half asleep, and I heard Burnell when he come in. He always called me little brother, and he said, little brother, and I thought he was, I said, I ain't got time for this. And then he, then he come into the bedroom, I can remember, he came into the bedroom, Ricky, and he said, Gene, he called my name, he said, Gene. And when he called my name, I knew that he was, uh, we always call it three sheets in the wind, he was about one sheet in the wind. He still had his faculties, he still knew what he was talking about, he said, Gene, I want to talk to you. I heard that voice. I jumped. I, actually, I can remember. I jumped. I pulled a cover down. I put a pillow behind my back. I said, what is it, Burnell? I said, for him more to talk serious to me, I said, what is it? He said, Gene, this has happened to you. He said, if I decided that I wanted to do this, would I have to go down to that church you're going to down there and get up and tell people? I said, Burnell, listen to me. And I, I know I don't have this totally correct, but in essence, this is what he said. He said, do I have to do that? I said, Burnell, listen to me. I said, you don't have to go to any preacher. You don't have to go to any church. You don't have to go to anybody. I said, you can get out in a pine sapling field somewhere right by yourself. Nobody around right by yourself, Burnell. And just look up and acknowledge you're lost and ask the Lord to save you and he'll save you. It's that simple, church. We got religion wrapped around real salvation that camouflages the message. See, Jesus wants us to present Jesus, not your doctrine, not your activities, not how good you are, 
It's the fact he wants us to humble ourselves down and say, I'm a sinner and I recognize that all have sinned. And then you know what happens? Listen to me, it's the most glorious thing that ever happened. The one thing I told people for years, I got away from it. I've been saved since 1963, but when I get to preaching like this, it comes alive to me again. The one thing I wanted to get to people with, I laid in many a jail cell looking up, saying, what is this all about? What is this all about? You got a reputation you got to fulfill. Boo, you know what I'm talking about. Mike, you know what I'm talking about. You got that reputation. People expect you to be a certain way, and I didn't want to be that way, but I didn't know how to get loose from it. And for several years, and I was a young man, but for several years, I was tormented in my mind. I was tormented in my mind. And when the Lord saved me in Russellville, Alabama, there's a peace. I felt God like I'm telling you. I still feel the Lord as I'm preaching to you now. But that peace that came in is priceless. No money can buy it. Nobody can give it to you except Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Would you stand, please?